Okay. Right. Okay. Let's. Um, so that. So we'll be looking at uh, this usage, this phrase in the Bible, which says praying in the spirit. So we need to be clear. You know, praying in the spirit equals praying in tongues. Okay. And how do we know for sure that praying in the spirit equals praying in tongues? Is this is the text, one Corinthians fourteen, right, and fourteen onwards, where Paul explains while he's explaining, while he's teaching about praying in tongues, he explains. And he uses this, uh, uh, you know, he uses this phrase, praying with the spirit to refer to praying in tongues, praying with the understanding to refer to praying in your own language. Okay, so he's talking about praying in the spirit, singing with the spirit, and so on. Okay, okay, so now, um, so we, we were looking at, you know, how tongues primarily, you know, it can be used for different uses, but then personal use is for edification and so on. So Paul also, while writing about praying in tongues, he, he says, um, he actually lays down some guidelines for how praying in tongues should be when it comes to a public gathering. Okay, So suppose there's a public gathering. Now can the question is, can we still pray in tongues? Right? Um, and he actually uh, refers to certain, uh, you know, certain things here. And um, and he says in church gatherings, these are some guidelines. Okay, um, let's look at yeah, one Corinthians fourteen and verse five. Okay, one Corinthians fourteen verse five. Now he's addressing the gathering of people. They've been gathering for prayer. They're gathering for they're meeting together as a church. So he's he's you know he's uh, addressing that in the sense he's talking to them as they gather together. You know about tongues right so verse 5 he says i wish you all spoke with tongues but even more that you prophesied for he who prophesies is greater than he who speaks with tongues unless indeed he interprets that the church may receive sorry edification okay so what is he saying here i wish you all what is paul's desire i wish you all spoke with tongues okay you church, you believers gathering together, my desire is that you all speak with tongues. Okay, so he's saying that. Um, then he goes on to say, but he who, he, he who prophesies is greater. So does that mean that prophecy is greater than tongues? Yeah. It would seem that way. You know, if you just take that line out of context, it would seem that way, that the gift of prophecy is better or greater than the gift of tongues. But what is Paul's intention is saying that? He's saying publicly, if somebody gathers together and addresses the gathering in tongues, right? If I speak to you in tongues for five minutes, you might listen. 10 minutes, you will get restless. 15 minutes, you will just think, hey, what is happening here? Because you don't know how to respond, right? I'm just speaking in tongues into the mic. You know, I'm just speaking in tongues. And then maybe you will also start praying in tongues. But, you know, that could happen. But otherwise, you might be wondering, you know, why, why, what is happening here? And let's say somebody, you know, who is not a believer walks in and sees that. Okay, so Paul is addressing, you know, when you are gathered together as a church, you know, there are certain certain things that you need to do, there are certain things that you should not do. And his intention is saying, in saying that, you know, he who prophesies is greater is because he's saying when there is prophecy, there is edification. People are encouraged, right? People are built up, encouraged. They are, uh, it says, some prophecy results in edification, exhortation, comfort. People are built up, they are encouraged, they are comforted, right? Because they are receiving a prophetic word, like God who knows the needs of people, God who knows the current condition of people's hearts. You receive a word, a prophetic word. So whenever you receive a prophetic word, you are, you are encouraged. Wow, God spoke. God knows exactly. God knows the details. So that's what he's saying. You know, unless there is interpretation in a public gathering, then the people are not blessed. People are not edified. Okay, that is in verse verse five. Let's look at verse twelve. 
verse 12, he says, Even so you, since you are zealous for spiritual gifts, let it be for the edification of the church that you seek to excel. Verse 12. Let's look at verse 11. So he says, Therefore, if I do not know the meaning of the language, I shall be a foreigner to him who speaks, and he who speaks will be a foreigner to me. In the sense that person is praying and speaking in tongues, I don't understand. I am speaking in tongues, that person doesn't understand. So he's saying, unless there is interpretation. So that is what he's saying. So he's saying, let it be for the edification of the church. OK, one more verse, the next verse. Therefore, let him who speaks in a tongue pray that he may interpret. OK. So what is this thing? There's a gathering. People are gathered. You begin to speak in tongues to the people. Pray that you may interpret. Okay, that is the next gift that we are going to look at, interpretation of tongues. right? So pray that you may interpret so that people may understand and be edified. You know, maybe you're saying some, you know, some prophetic things about the people even as you're praying in tongues. Right? It could be about people's needs. It could be, about, it could be a prophetic word even. Right? And then he says, there needs to be interpretation. What does interpretation mean? The meaning of it, right? The meaning of what you're speaking. If it, unless there is an explanation of that, then people are not blessed. Okay, so that is what he's saying. Okay, then, um, so the question is this, you know, for us as believers, um, can we pray in tongues when we gather together? So that is the question, right? You know, maybe as churches, can we gather together? Can we pray in tongues? You know, as as a fellowship, as believers, as we gather together, can we pray in tongues? The answer is yes. You know, Paul says, if you, if you go on to, uh, let me just share a couple of uh, verses here, right? Um, um, yeah, let's look at. Same uh, chapter 14, okay. Um, verse 27, okay. 14, verse 27, he says, Now, again, it's a gathering. If anyone speaks in a tongue, so you're gathering, you get up and you speak in a tongue. That's the situation, right? If anyone speaks in a tongue, let there be two, or at the, at the most three, each in turn, and let one interpret. Okay, so here's a speaking in tongue. He's saying, believe God for interpretation. And, you know, that is, that is implied. And let one interpret. But if there is no interpreter, there is no interpretation. Right? What is he saying? Let him keep silent in church. Okay, so which means don't stand up and address the gathering in tongues. Okay, let him keep silent in church. Look at the second part of it. What verse we are looking at? Verse 28. What is the second part of that verse? What does it say? Anyone? Verse 28. Yeah. So he says, let him keep silent in church and let him speak to himself and to God. Okay, so where is this? Where is this happening? In the church. People are gathered. So he's saying, if there is no interpretation, let him just pray on his own between himself and God. So he's not saying, don't pray in tongues when you're in church. You stepped into church, no tongues. He doesn't say that. He says, you pray between yourself and God. Maybe you pray to God, you sing in the spirit, whatever. Let it not be a public addressing in a gathering. Okay. So many people you know, say, no tongues at all in church. Absolutely no tongues. That's not what he's saying. What he's saying is, if it's a public gathering, if it's a public addressing, unless there is interpretation, people are not blessed. So he also says, right? Um, and I'd rather speak uh, when he, um, which verse is that? So, uh, you know, I'd rather speak a few words that you may understand rather than many words, right? Um, which you don't understand. So um, I'm just trying to get that verse. Yeah, verse 9. 
right? So un unless you utter by the tongue words easy to understand, how will it be known what is spoken? For you will be speaking into the air, right? Um, and then he talks about so many kinds of tongues in the world. He's talking about uh, languages, earthly languages, none of them without significance, etc. Right? So, um, so then he says that if it's a gathering, let there be interpretation. Otherwise, let him between himself and to God, let him speak in tongues. That's fine. Between him and God, let him pray, let him sing, let him, you know, it's fine. Okay. And Paul says, you know, brothers, you know, I pray in tongues more than you all. He's saying it's not like coming from someone who does not pray in tongues. He said, you know, I do pray in tongues. I pray in tongues more than you all, but in a gathering, I'd rather pray between myself and God unless there is a interpretation. Like we saw, the Corinthian church is a very gifted church. Right? Okay. Um, there's a question. Is it in reference to the person who's preaching or the congregation who is attending? Okay, good question. So he, you know, um, he's actually talking about the gathering. Right. So if you look at verse 26, if you read the whole chapter, that's very helpful. So he's talking in context of the gathering. Um, if, you, if you look at verse 26, he says, How is it then, brethren, whenever you come together, each of you has a psalm, has a teaching, has a tongue, has a revelation, has an interpretation. Let all th th things be done for edification. Okay, so he's talking about a gathering. So he's not specifically talking about a designated a preacher or a speaker, right? He's talking about a gathering. So, um, you know, obviously it was, maybe it was not such a big gathering as, you know, some of the churches that we see today, but it was a, it was a, it was a, maybe they gathered together. I don't know the number. We don't know the numbers, but here it says, you know, each of you, you're coming with the psalm, you're coming with the revelation, coming with the teaching, coming with the tongue, coming with the interpretation, right? So, which means when we go back to us, chapter 12 and um, and you know verse 11 he says the one and the same spirit works all these things distributing to each one so each one of them who have gathered distributing to each one has he wills okay so uh, so the answer is yes he's talking about the whole gathering he's talking about the, uh, the utterance of tongues for the whole gathering. He's talking about the interpretation of tongues for, for the whole gathering. In short, he's talking about the gifts of the Spirit for the entire gathering and not just for the designated speaker or a preacher. Okay. I hope that helps. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, you know, so therefore he is talking about this interpretation. Okay. So, um, so in the public gathering, it is, you know, let it be with, with interpretation, okay? And in a public gathering, it could also be that tongues could be a sign for the unbeliever. Uh, you know, like how we saw it worked in Acts chapter 2, right? They were unbelievers, which means they were Jews, but they did not believe in the Messiah. But they were there, gathered for the feasts of first fruits and feast of, the, you know, Pentecost. They gathered from surrounding regions. Now they heard these disciples who are Jewish speak in other languages, their own languages, but they were actually declaring the virtues of God, saying they were praising God in their tongue. You know, one thing is to speak a language, okay? Speak a language like use of language, you know, how are you? Where are you? You know, uh, what is the time? Okay, an unknown language. Here, they were declaring the praises of God, right? Which means they're, they're talking about God, they're talking about His praises, they're talking about His attributes in that language. So that was a sign for the unbeliever. They heard, they were amazed, they were perplexed, and they, they, they heard Peter preach that message, and at the end of the message they came, they said, what must we do? Right? So it was a sign for the believer, for the unbeliever, right, about the Messiah, it was a sign for the unbeliever to actually respond, ask questions and respond, what should I do now? Right? What should I do to be saved, in other words? Right? So it acts as a sign to the unbeliever as well. We've heard many you know, interesting um, 
stories as well, right? Um, okay, John has a question. Then is it right to speak in tongues in the time of leading worship in the public gathering? Okay, so let's say uh, um, there, you know, there's a gathering and then, you know, the worship leaders may be singing in tongues or praying in tongues. Okay, so, so the, the question is this, you know, what kind of a gathering is it? Right? Is, it is it an outreach meeting, evangelistic meeting, or is it a gathering of believers who who understand what is happening, who understand the gifts of the Spirit. No, it's a gathering of believers. So, um, so we can always say, okay, now we're we just between you, yourself and God. Let's begin to just pray in the Spirit. Stir yourself up. Begin to pray in the Spirit. You know, begin to sing in the Spirit. You know, stir yourself up and do that. Right. So, as a church or as a body of believers, we are collectively, you know, getting into the deeper things of God. You know, we are collectively being edified. Uh, you know, stirring ourselves up in the spirit, right? So that's that's fine. That is fine, as long as there is understanding. You can just explain. You know, I know that you know all of us pray in spirit, and uh, now let's take this time, maybe the next ten minutes or so, to just pray in the spirit, just between you and God, just between you and God. Just go ahead and pray in the spirit. So we we take the ten minutes or fifteen minutes to you know just pray pray out in the spirit, pray uh, pray in tongues. So that is fine. Right. So, you know, uh, some practical things, normally what, you know, I personally, what I do is I just encourage people to sing out in tongues, pray in tongues. And uh, but I, you know, after I do that, I step away from the mic. Like I all just step behind back and then begin to pray loudly so that it's, it's, it doesn't hinder anyone, doesn't, uh, you know, interrupt anyone, um, doesn't disturb anyone. But I just step away and uh, I begin to pray in tongues or sing in tongues. Uh, that's something that I do, you know, personally, um, so that it doesn't hinder anyone, block it. Yeah. Okay, we have another question, I think. Yeah, that helps, uh, Blessing, that's fine. Yeah, okay. Um, I have rarely or almost never witnessed anyone interpreting while someone else is speaking in tongues. Um, is it correct in saying the gift of interpretation tongues is very rare when compared to the number of people uh, with the gift of tongue speaking in tongues? Okay, so yeah, so Esther, uh, same here. I've, not, I've also not seen too much of it in operation. Um, maybe this is my opinion. Maybe is it's because we're not really pursuing, right? See what happens is like when it comes to interpretation of tongues, uh, which is the next topic. In fact, I think we can go there. Okay. Uh, next chapter. It's um, so. What is interpretation of tongues? It is interpretation is simply um, you know it's the uh, explanation or the meaning of something that is uttered, right? Um, and I also want to say that interpretation is different from translation. Okay. Uh, how and why? You know, translation could be word for word. Right. So suppose I say hello, the translator will say, what do you say hello in Hindi? Hello only. <laughs> okay. Some some other thing, you know, maybe in Tamil they'll say Vanakam. Okay, so say hello, or somebody will say namaste. Right. So it's word line for line or word for word translation. Like when you translate a book, you are actually doing it so that you don't want to miss out the essence of it. You're translating it, you know, this book into other language. So that's translation. Interpretation, interpretation would be a summary of it, right? It could be an explanation. It could be a meaning. And it could be like, what he's actually saying is this. Right? It's not a word for word, right? So that's the general understanding, translation, interpretation. So, OK, so uh, interpretation of tongues. We'll answer Esther's question, you know. Interpretation of tongue can happen Either you know when to the same person who's actually praying in tongues or to another person, right? In a public gathering, it could be one the person who is actually speaking in tongues gets the sense of the meaning of what is being what he or she is actually praying. Okay. Now you might say, okay, why? Maybe we've not, you know, why is this not seen in operation? Maybe we've not exercised that gift. Right? Maybe we've not exercised it. Um, you know how how does interpretation ha how does inter interpretation occur? The same way, you know, we looked at the parallel between physical senses and spiritual senses, right? 
And these gifts are actually related, in, I mean, are released in the spirit. Now, when it, there's a sense of knowing, maybe, there is a sense of maybe of something visual, like a picture or a video, or there's a scripture verse that is coming into your heart, even as you're praying in the spirit. Well, that is when we believe God and say, Lord, it says, ask for the interpretation, right? So we ask for the interpretation. So we ask, and the Holy Spirit responds by giving us that interpretation. Maybe we did not really catch it, right? Maybe we did not really receive that as an interpretation. Maybe we just thought, okay, some random thing, right? So consciously, if we would exercise it, right, uh, it would be, it, it is possible. And also, I think, given the size of the churches today, you know, size of gatherings, let's say, even if it's more than 20, 20 people or 30 people in a gathering, you know, it becomes, it becomes slightly difficult to actually exercise this gift, you know. Let's say you have a gathering of maybe 350 to 400 people. Just think about it, right? Uh, people cannot be audible. They either they should grab a mic or something. So uh, it is, you know, it just it doesn't become feasible, right? So, so one of the things is that we've not really pursued it, maybe, right? But I've seen it, you know, I've seen it where the person uh, herself prays over another person praying in tongues and with the interpretation, you know, this is what God's saying, or, you know, this is what it is my son, my daughter, and, and so on. So I've seen the same person interpreting. And um, uh, I've also yeah, I've heard of, uh, uh, you know, this particular instance in our one of our youth gatherings where somebody prayed in the spirit and they knew that this was what it was. And then they got permission to share, you know, this is what I sense is the um, interpretation of the spirit. And uh, I think one, one time, I'm sure it must be there in the, you know, in our archives video, that one time when, uh, when when Pastor Ashish asked me to pray in tongues, I said, "Okay, I let me sing in tongues." So I sang in tongues. It was at the end of the service, and then uh, and then he interpreted it, and what he shared really witnessed with my spirit. Right when I was praying, singing in tongues, I just felt, right, okay, this is what it could be, and, and uh, he. Um, he kind of interpreted it after I sang out, and he said, "This is this is what I sense in my spirit, uh, the meaning or the gist of what was sung, and uh, it witnessed with my spirit." Now, yeah, so yeah, so that would be my response. Um, I think Shani, you got your hands raised. Yeah, uh, we'll I'll, I'll just come back to it, Shani. Uh, come back to you, Shani. One second. One more question: Does this essentially mean praying and understanding can ever be considered as? Praying in the spirit, yeah. That phrase, that usage, praying in the spirit, you know, is is praying in tongues, according to New Testament scripture. Okay, um, praying in the Holy Spirit uh, and Ephesians, you know, praying with all prayer and supplication in the spirit. Ephesians six, one Corinthians fourteen, eighteen, you know, praying uh, of or fourteen onwards. Pray the spirit, pray the understanding. So that is how they understood it. But you know, when we pray with the understanding, can the Holy Spirit lead us to pray for other matters, right? Pray for the you know the future of the country, pray for the economy, and you're praying in your own language. Absolutely. The Holy Spirit can lead us to do that. But that usage, praying in the spirit, uh, according to you know the New Testament church and, and what we scriptures that we see refers to praying in tongues. Right? That is what I was mentioning. Okay. Yeah, Shani, your question, please. Yeah, I just I want to make sure I have an understanding because I know a lot of churches you can just don't, believe, the don't believe in like speaking in tongues because you're supposed to have an interpreter to say it. So you saying that if you're at church and you're speaking in tongues or at home, it's okay. But I want to make sure I'm getting an understanding. But when you are in front and speaking to like the audience and you're speaking in tongues, then yeah. somebody there should be interpreting. Is that yeah. correct? Yeah, exactly, exactly. So, so there are, there could be two scenarios. One, I'm addressing a gathering. It could be a mixed crowd. It could be you know in, in a church. So we have believers, we have unbelievers uh, in the meeting. So you know when I'm when I'm praying in a tongue or speaking in a tongue. Uh, and addressing the crowd, they, how are people blessed only with the interpretation, right? So it's it's more from the context of 
from for the edification of those who are gathered. So that is the that is Paul's intention. He's not saying that hey, if you pray in a tongue, you're sinning. He's not saying that. But he's saying, you know, people will be blessed only if there is interpretation. Right? And he's saying, do everything in an orderly manner, without confusion, right? So so that's the thing. So people are blessed only when there is uh, interpretation. People are edified. Scenario number two could be, let's say we are gathered for prayer and most or all who have gathered are, you know, people who, under, who have that understanding of what praying in tongues is all about. You know, let's say like a Bible college, prayer time, gathering, you know, we, we know what this is. And then if someone who is leading that, particular meeting says, you know, let's all together pray in tongues. Let's lift our voices and pray in tongues. Let's lift our voices and sing in tongues. You know, that could be a, a second scenario, which is which is permitted, which is possible, and it can be a, a time of edification, right? And there's there's no need for interpretation at that time where each person is personally, between them and the Lord, they are praying and they're pursuing, you know, the presence and power of God, and they're saying, God, I want to be edified, and so they are Praying in the spirit and singing in the spirit. Okay, and I just, uh, I just want. Okay, so that clears it up. And then I, I think you said that when you interpret, like when somebody is interpreting, you said that uh, a, a picture may appear. That's what I thought you said. I wasn't sure if you said that. I need a clarification on that. And then also yeah. too, when you gave the example about somebody praying for somebody, so you can you could be speaking in tongues and you can be the one interpreting, even though you're praying over somebody else. I just want a clarification. Right. Right. Yes. So the interpret. So who interprets? It could be yourself. Right? It could be yourself if you're praying in tongues. You could receive the interpretation. Or it could be another person or maybe multiple people who receive the interpretation in their spirit um, when, when they hear somebody praying in, in tongues. Right? Because that is the gift of interpretation. Against, again, it's a work of the Holy Spirit bringing interpretation to people. So. It could be like, you know, maybe we, we could, you know, work or demonstrate it and uh, you know, maybe pursue it, right? Uh, and it will be for the edification of the church. And also, Pastor, what about a picture, Sean? Did you say something like sometimes an image may show in terms of you, in terms of you interpreting what somebody said? Did you say that? I wasn't clear. I'm sorry, sorry. Uh, I thought you said I was writing, but I thought that you said that sometimes when you're interpreting, it may not be kind of words, like you might get an image. Did you say that? Yeah. Be, okay. Yeah, so so I was talking about how, how one can receive that interpretation. Like it could be words, it could be images, it could be a prompting, it could be, um, you know, just like how we've talked about the, the parallel between the natural, uh, like how we receive information from the natural world. And we, we, we saw that how, you know, in the spirit, uh, we have our, what do you call sense organs, or that is how we receive. You know, uh, in the spirit as well, and the Holy Spirit speaks to us in dreams, visions, and and that's a, that seems to be the language of the spirit. So uh, the Holy, we need to be mindful of what the Holy Spirit is putting in our hearts, and the interpretation that could come in that way also. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Right. Okay. Okay, so um, to be looking at uh, interpretation of tongues, right? Um, okay, so it's um, so I, it, it's not word for word. For for example, um, you know, somebody could be praying um, in, you know, maybe a, it it could be like two three sentences, and the interpretation could be one sentence, right? So it, it's actually a summary. It could be a, um, you know, it could be something which is very compacted, right? It could be like that also, because it is not translation, right? It's, it could be a summary of it. It could be a meaning of it, which is which is given. Okay, so, uh, so we don't have to think, OK, hey, this person spoke three sentences. Now the interpretation is just one sentence. You know, how is that? Because it's interpretation. It's not translation. Or it could be like, you know, that person just spoke a line or a phrase in tongues. And how come the interpretation is so much more? Right, it is interpretation. There, there is explanation and and so on. Right, okay, fine. So, um, so does this have a biblical precedent? Okay, now in the Old Testament, like we don't see that. We don't see any direct expression of that. But we do see something where there is interpretation uh, in terms of 
words, especially when Daniel was actually in the court of um, Belshazzar, right? Where there is this hand, supernatural act of God coming in, writing something. It's a completely unknown language. Right? There are many learned men. The king is obviously scared because it happened right there. They could not explain it. And it's on the wall. You know, just imagine this wall behind. There's a hand, big hand comes and writes out something. Like it, everybody's saying, hey, do, is that the, your language? You know, do you understand it? No, no, no. And then the, somebody says, hey, there's Daniel. So Daniel comes and then he interprets it. You know, this is the meaning. Right? He says, Mene, Mene, Tekel, Uparsin. And then he goes on to give the meaning of that. Your days are numbered, etc. Right? So we see that in the Old Testament. But however, we don't see the way it is in the New Testament. We don't see it. Um, right? OK. Biblical New, ex uh, biblical example, uh, New Testament example, obviously, in 1 Corinthians. So Paul felt the necessity to teach them and how they should do it. Right? He said one or two people take turns to pray in tongues and then let there be interpretation. So, um, so obviously, we can, we, we, we can conclude that this was happening in the Corinthian church. right? This was happening in Corinth, uh, in the church. And therefore, he felt that, hey, guys, you know, instead of everybody you know, just, uh, just creating some kind of chaos, you know, let's do it in order. You know, you you stand up, you speak up, and let someone interpret, right? So he he gives that. So we see that. Um, how how does it help? Okay, so it helps the believer uh, where we know, you know, we let's say maybe we are, you know, let's say for personal use, right? You are praying in tongues yourself, and then you are saying, Lord, you give me the meaning of it. You give me the interpretation of it, right? I'm speaking something, right? The Bible talks about how when we pray in tongues, one, we are personally edified. 1 Corinthians 14, he says, you know, we are also speaking mysteries, right? Things that we, things that are there uh, that we do not yet understand. Uh, you know, when we are praying, we, we don't know what we should pray for, but we begin to pray the Holy Spirit prays, right? So we ask the Lord, Lord, give me an understanding. Give me the interpretation. So let the gifts of interpretation also be made manifest, okay? And just like how the Holy Spirit would speak to us, now this is something that we need to, again, grow in, right? And uh, and learn to learn to flow in in it. Right? So we receive that, and then we we share, we share, or we speak it out ourselves. If we are just by ourselves, we speak it out, you know. So uh, it could be a flow of, you know, you pray in tongues. And then you begin to alternatively you pray your speak out in your known language, right? And then you pray again in tongues, and then you pray uh, speak out in a known language, or you pray in tongues, and you wait um, for something you know to bubble up on the inside where the Holy Spirit places. It may be a scripture verse, maybe um, you know, like we said, there could be other things. You know, where the Holy Spirit is prompting, maybe something pictorial, maybe a scripture verse, maybe you know, something that is putting in, and uh, we can either speak that out, or maybe we can even write it out. Okay, this is a good way. So maybe this week you can try that out, right? Till we meet in our next class, you can try that out. Uh, pray. It could be for your plans, understanding your purposes. It could be maybe for something that we've been praying about. Uh, some important decision. Uh, it could be, um, you know, revelation of scripture, understanding of scripture, right? It could be all that. So it's all exciting, um, maybe to receive inspiration, creative ideas, and strategies. So it's not just for, you know, uh, ministry or something spiritual, but um, spiritual in nature. You know, when I say spiritual nature, I'm talking about you know something to do with scripture verses or understanding of it. But it could be also for you know, practical use in the world outside, in the marketplace. And maybe you're a businessman, maybe you're a you know, person. You know, I was just listening to a podcast uh, as I was coming. And then, um, so this is about this person who, who receives this, you know, it's more to do with prophetic dream, but I'm just sharing that, um, you know, who received this dream or he saw this vision as he was sleeping. But it was just three or four letters. Okay, I think it was A D V something. So he woke up, 
he googled it now this guy was an engineer right he googled it and he and it actually referred to um, a branch of study or some algorithm and he he actually did that for he was actually um, uh, you know doing his masters in engineering so he did research on that he uh, he presented a paper on that and he got invited he says he got invited to speak in the army the navy because he had served in the military after doing his bachelor's and and how did this come information come right in a in a dream he was a believer right spirit filled believer wanting to go for missions etc but god said you know you stay there and i have you know purpose in the engineering field in the engineering industry and and this is how it happened okay so it's not all that to say that it's not just for within the four walls of the church or you know something to do with understand better under all that is there but it's also for practical use in terms of maybe inventions and you know new things innovations in the marketplace right okay so so we that that is tongues and interpretation so for personal you know personal use and also when it comes to a public gathering we follow this you know we follow these guidelines what is it unless there is an interpretation do not you know address the crowd uh, you know if you if you feel a sense that yes there will be uh, a, an interpretation you know you go ahead and address or you know we address and then wait for an interpretation now that's a scary thing right suppose you know students are there and people are watching online and i say you know let's i I'm just i just feel like praying right now in the spirit and you know releasing these words in the spirit in tongues and i say you know i believe that god will give you the interpretation so why don't you as you receive the interpretation why don't you just speak it out and i'm just waiting and everybody's like okay when does this class get over <laughs> right it's a it's a scary thing but um i think we should do it right and like i still ask that question you know why is it not i think we're not pursuing that you know right uh, and you know all these gifts of the spirit it's an act of faith we step out in faith um and we grow you know we learn we grow a part of learning is also making mistakes right and um, and admitting that that is why you know paul writes about test all things like this testing is also part of the prophetic is also part of the gifting and uh, of the spiritual gifts and like we said you know it doesn't mean that god's gift is deficient in any way right we're not saying that god's give something wrong with it that therefore therefore we need to test no it just means that god's gift is perfect because he is perfect he is good but we as human beings when we receive um you know we have our own prejudices biases our own wrong understanding maybe right therefore we test we test according to god's word based on the word of god can this be god hey he's asking i'm getting this idea to go rob a bank can this be god what do you think go rob a bank and give it to the poor pay off all the bible college students fees go rob a bank can this be god obviously no because psalm 23 says that he leads me in paths of righteousness so is this the righteous path to go rob a bank obviously no so we drop that idea that's not god okay so that is why we have this whole thing of testing okay let's move on to the next gift prophecy okay um so we're looking at the third one prophecy so prophecy if you want to simply define it or define it in a very simple way is god speaking to man through man okay god wants to speak our god is a speaking god god is a real god it's not just a theoretical idea god speaks god is speaking to people through people right so people are his mouthpieces and they share or they share what god is putting in their heart so um so it does not uh, you know we need to understand it's it's not about good preaching it's not about being a very good orator right it is about being sensitive to what god is saying and putting in our hearts and being faithful to it it could be passing on a message it could be you know doing something right you you obey god says you give this 
and you received it. It's a property act, right? You receive and you you receive that instruction and you you do it. Right? So that's prophecy, right? Okay. So what happens? Simply, simply, prophecy brings edification, exhortation, and comfort. How do we know that? 1 Corinthians 14 and um, verse 3. But he who prophesies speaks edification, exhortation, and comfort to men. Okay, so edification means there is spiritually or built up. Exhortation, there's encouragement. Comfort is, you know, consolation and you're greatly comforted, right? It also has other elements. The prophetic word would have also other elements, like we see in scripture, that it could involve correction. Nathan, prophet Nathan, God used all, all the other prophets in the Old Testament to bring correction to, to kings right, or to other people. Bring correction. What you're doing is wrong. Right? It could be direction or revelation. You know, they would go and ask the prophets, what should we do? King Jehoshaphat, right? They went, what should we do? And uh, Elisha, he gave them direction, right? So we see this. So, uh, you know, entire scripture, 1 Peter 3, uh, 1 Peter, sorry, 2 Peter 1, talks about that scripture is itself is prophetic um, or inspired by God. Okay, so it's a it's from the heart of God, inspired by God. So the word of God itself is prophetic in nature. Okay. Okay. So Old Testament, we see several examples, right? Any Old Testament examples of people being prophesying that you can think of? Specific instances. Anything? Old Testament examples. How someone went and prophesied to another person. Anyone? Old Testament, Genesis to Malachi. Examples. Pastor, Prophet yeah. Elijah. Prophet? Prophet Elijah, he spoke to King Ahab mm. about the false prophets. Okay. He prophesied. Right, right. And also, since you mentioned, um, you know, uh, Elijah about rain, right? Yeah. Yeah, he prophesied that hey, there's going to be famine, and then, um, yeah, there's no rain, and then he said, there will be rain, and then he, he there was rain, right? It, so, so the Old Testament is actually full of prophets, full of prophecies, right? It's all there. You want to say something on prophet on the prophets only? Yeah. So, right. So, so, so we have you know there's an Old Testament precedent, right? Um, and then several examples in the New Testament also. You know when we when we started this um, uh, this subject this course, we looked at um, how uh, you know before the uh, how, the work of the Holy Spirit just before Jesus arrived on the scene, right? And we see that there was a lot of prophecy happening, right? John the Baptist's father, Zacharias, you know, he he prophesied over his own son, right? And then Elizabeth, she prophesied. Who, who did she prophesy over? Elizabeth? Huh? About? About uh, Mary. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Mary. So what did she prophesy? She said, you know, it's interesting. She said, how is it that the mother of my Lord has come to meet me? Right? She, 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 she's prophesying over Mary. Now, Mary did not tell Elizabeth that she was expecting. She was carrying. Um, okay, somebody's... Um, is that here? Okay. Okay, so she did not tell Mary that she was... That Mary was, Mary did not tell Elizabeth that she was expecting, right? But it so happened that Elizabeth knew. How did she know by the 
Holy Spirit. So we see all those instances. Elizabeth was filled with this Holy Spirit, prophesied uh, to Mary, Zechariah, Simeon prophesied, uh, Anna was a prophetess, she prophesied, um, you know, uh, John the Baptist, the Lord Jesus himself, he many times, right, now what I can, uh, you know, immediately comes to my mind is he saw uh, Nathaniel and he said, there's a man, you know, without, in whom there is no guile. Okay, so he he meets Nathaniel and he says, "Here's a man who, who in whom there is no guile." And then Nathaniel is is amazed. He said, "How do you know me? We, we haven't met before. How do you know me?" Then he then he says that before you know before I, I saw you, I saw you actually you know under that tree and and so on. So he had this image of uh, so the prophetic gift was working in him as well. And we know that everything that Jesus did was by the anointing of the Holy Spirit and so you know we see that in operation okay then we look at the early church right several instances again um, you know starting with the outpouring of the Holy Spirit uh, the Old Testament prophecy of the prophet Joel which Peter actually referred to okay in the message in the sermon and he says you know this is what will happen when there's an outpouring of the Holy Spirit, what are the things that your sons and your daughters will prophesy? Okay, your sons and your daughters will prophesy. So, this prophetic is something for everybody. Okay, it's a gift of the Spirit, just like we said. The gifts of the Spirit are for all believers. Okay, now we'll, you know, we've also learned that there is the ministry gift and the gifts of the Spirit. Right? There's a difference. Some are called to the ministry office or ministry responsibility, and therefore the ministry gift. But all are called for this walking in this gifts of the Spirit, to receive and experience and to move in the gifts of the Spirit. Right? Okay. Okay, so several New Testament examples. Right? So which means that this applies for us today as well okay so don't discount oh it was there in new testament times it was there in old testament times um, it's applied it's applicable for today's church okay for us today okay so um that's all we have time for today i'm, I'm uh we'll wind up today and um, we'll come back next week and then we'll look at the rest of the so the spirit thank you so much god bless Thank mm -hmm. you.